Hello, I think we're live. Um, I want to welcome everyone tonight. Uh, my name is Bryn Larson, and I'm one of the co-owners of Photo Relevance in Houston, Texas. And um, on the call tonight, um, but behind the scenes, um, we have Jeffrey Kozlov, who is my uh, partner in crime and the other owner of the gallery. And we also have Suzanne Zeller, who's our assistant director, who's masterminding our Zoom, and Alana Campbell, who helped put everything together. And we have our esteemed and fabulous artist guest tonight, um, Daisy Patton, um, who is here with me. And we're so excited to have this opportunity to speak with you about this monumental and incredible show um, with your work being seen in Houston for the first time. And you have not been able to travel and come down and see it. So we've been sharing all of these wonderful installation images and um, all the reactions from people who've been able to come and see the show. So I know you've been following all of that, um, but we're so delighted to welcome you and to have the opportunity to ask you some questions tonight and give you a little bit more of a chance to fill us in down here um, and everywhere um, where people are joining us from tonight um, to talk a little bit more about this incredible series. And the title of the show is a very intriguing title, With Hands Clasped Tightly. And I'm going to give you a little bit more of an opportunity to tell us about that. Um, but first, I wanted to just give a little more background about Daisy. Um, so photo relevance, as um, many of you on the line will know, um, we had our start um, a number of years ago, really focusing on photo uh, based art. And Daisy is really pushing us in a wonderful multimedia direction um, because it has been uh, few and far between that we have shown work where the artist that we are featuring is not the person who created the underlying imagery. Um, in most of the cases, um, the artists that we have featured are creating the photography. Daisy's work is um, using vernacular and found photography, and she's truly a multidisciplinary artist. Um, she was born in Los Angeles. Um, since we've known her, she's been in Western Massachusetts in a studio um, that lost power and all kinds of creature comforts uh, during the creation of these stunning paintings. Um, so she was working uh, with lanterns and flashlights and all kinds of things um, during part of this process. Um, I've seen and had the privilege uh, to enjoy your work um, at the Denver Art Museum. I was in Denver earlier this year and also saw an incredible show at the Denver Contemporary Museum that featured your work. Um, you're in some great collections, everything from the Tampa Museum to Seattle University, uh, Fidelity Investments Art Collection has your work. And um, you've also got lots of other things going on, including the publication in the last couple of years of a beautiful little book with uh, Minerva Projects Press um, that includes essays and poetry and kind of even pushes you in a more multidisciplinary way um, to have some, some written uh, components here. Um, and you started, um, you, I guess you're in Western Massachusetts and you did your MFA in Boston um, at the museum um, in at the, the program there with the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and Tufts University. So um, so welcome. And Thank it's you. so nice to, to see you. So why don't you tell us, I think Suzanne can um, give us some slides and we wanna share with people um, some of these beautiful images. And we also have some images to give us uh, a little bit of background. Um, so let's see if maybe Suzanne can advance us um, to give us one thing um, that will, will start us off. So this is a fabulous installation shot um, of one of the walls, two of the walls in the gallery, we should say. Um, we have a wonderful uh, Robert Langham um, on the far left there that's not part of Daisy's show, um, but we thought was a great uh, piece here in dialogue. Um, but this gives you a sense of just the monumental scale of these beautiful works. And um, why don't you tell us, Daisy, a little bit about the the scale and kind of how you came to this um thinking about this series and this size yeah that's a that's a great question um and hilariously enough i should say both of those paintings were the ones that were painted in the dark um about half the show was painted in the dark uh, we were displaced and didn't have power for two months and so yeah just as Bryn was saying 
little headlamp and a couple of little stand lights with an electric generator. So imagine trying to paint that very elaborate rug uh, patterning um, with just a little headlamp. Um, so for me, scale is really important with this work. So I actually preserve all of the original photographs. I don't, uh, you know, a lot of artists who work with found imagery tend to, um, you know, sort of cut or dissect the original images. So for me, it's really important to sort of preserve them. I, I see them almost as like historical documents in a way and wanting to break them out of that small um, intimate scale into something that is life-size. So that way audiences can have this sort of, you know, one-to-one -one connection with the people that they're looking at, um, which means that they get to be uh, very large very quickly as you can see here. Um, it's really yeah. amazing, actually, when you think about them, because when we first uh, started working with you, we had some smaller works where there was only one person in the image and maybe it was only um, a torso, you know, it was there or it was a, a bust. It was not the, the entire figure. And of course, um, these are images of families and with multiple people. And so they really are um, wonderful and, and enormous. And I love this idea that you want to engage with the figure's life size. So how did you come to that? Uh, you know, it was sort of a, a happy accident that started. So, you know, I, I was slowly starting to return into painting again after I left my MFA program. So I, I hit a painting block for eight years. And during that time, I became a photographer. So I did a lot of street and documentary work. I shot film, um, was film cameras, but I did digital printing. So I had all of this sort of background and knowledge of photography and specifically photo theory, um, which was really important to sort of become a bridge to lead back to painting again. Um, so I do see these, that these kind of uh, hybrid objects. They are paintings, but they're also, you know, this sort of in-between space, um, which sort of speaks to the, the overall series. Um, so um, can you remind me again the, the last part of that question? Well, I was just thinking about how unusual it is. So we, yeah. people, when people come into the gallery, and a lot of people have said, oh my God, you know, we, when we think of photography, especially vintage or found photography, it's small. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, when you find something and I know you're sourcing these images, um, you know, from old people's uh, photo albums, things in people's attics, some are coming to you or if you're searching on eBay or you find out about a collection of vintage photography and, and you really are pulling them from all over the world. But it's such an unusual idea, I think, to want them to um, to be life size, because that's not at all the material that you're finding. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I, as I was saying about the sort of happy accident, um, you know, I was working on another painting series where it was my family photographs and I was, uh, I, I didn't get to grow up with my father. I don't know who he is uh, beyond his cultural heritage um, and a couple of personal descriptors so that he's Iranian with red hair and green eyes and pigeon toed. And I am also pigeon toed um, and have little flints of red hair. Uh, when the sun is shining. And so um, the sort of like aspect of absence uh, is so very much present in my overall practice, absence and presence. And I had been working on these paintings and they were realistic paintings. And I, <clears throat> I hate realism <laughs> as far as like painting it. I just don't have that kind of patience. I, I prefer this more expressive sort of painting. And so I was getting to a point where I was just getting really frustrated. They were all family photo sized paintings and they were taking you know a, a month or more to make and I came across a box of photographs for sale in this Denver boutique and I had this sort of almost like immediate connection this sort of loss of kinship um, and wanting to sort of preserve and, and I don't know if rescue is the word I want to use but in any case they came home with me I scanned them because I had a, a photo scanner and um, managed to get my hands on a printer and did the research in terms of trying to mount a print to panel, painted over them and instantly they worked. And so that's where I started to sort of build the conceptual backing around it, um, thinking about photo theory and then, you know, sort of its juxtaposition with like painting and the ideas around time and death and loss and, and all of those sort of things, yeah. 
Yeah, it's amazing. I when I was introducing you and I was rattling off all of your accomplishments and collections and things, I didn't really say anything about your personal background. Um, but you have been thinking and working um, and coming back to um, these questions of family um, because of your your own family, and that you didn't know your father and he wasn't a part of your life, but you knew that he was from this very different place. And I think it's it's quite fascinating um, that there's an, a sense of nostalgia about these images because they're vintage and we're, we definitely feel that we're going to another place in time. Um, but I also, um, I guess I love this, the, the poignancy of, of it and how personal it is for you. And I actually, I have one of the things that you've written um, about uh, your series and I love this idea that you said, um, all I ever wanted was a photograph with a name and to know my family and its history. I'm always searching, even when I'm not, for some small glimmer that will finally illuminate what's been hidden from me. And so, I mean, I feel, I mean, I know for for so many artists, the the work that artists create is very personal. It's obviously coming from a very special place, but I think um, for, for me, this work really resonates because it's so universal also. You know, this is obviously personal, but then it's so universal because we all think about our families, the family we knew, the family we wish we had. And you're finding a way to bring these families back to life and give them stories that we never have been told, um, which I think is is really lovely and so interesting. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit, because Suzanne's got this slide up right now which gives us a really great um, sort of a segue from how small the pieces are when they come to you, how small the original images are when you find them, and then how you're working in your studio. And maybe tell people a little bit about the, the, the movement from the original photo to the enlargement to the painting. Yeah, so uh, that is actually my old studio, um, which was a one car garage. And I moved uh, last year and was able to build a, a studio, which I'm so thankful for. It is st still not big enough, but it's big enough to have made this show um, comfortably, which is which is fantastic. And so, yeah, so I the I have been collecting photographs since the beginning of this series, which um, I began in March of 2014. And at this point, my collection is a little over 5,000 photographs. Um, as Brent mentioned, I'm collecting widely um, across the world. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking about series within series. So, you know, in this particular case, uh, this show is about the family portrait specifically, but I've also done work around everything from um, women and female relationships, funerary images, um, the garden, all, all sorts of different things. So, you know, some of it comes down to like me trying to think and sort of curate together images that I think make sense in the context of an exhibition. So I go through all of the photos and, you know, I, I am thinking about a few things with that collection. Uh, you know, there's of course, Roland Barthes' idea of punctum or something that pierces him when he's looking at a photograph. For me, that's sort of a, a very similar uh, method of collecting. Uh, it's also you know, dimensions of personal uh, relationship or history. There are certain people that reminded me of my own family members mm -hmm. um, or of people that I am very close to. And so all that said, uh, once I've sort of dialed in what kind of images that I want to do, and I, I remember when we were first talking about this show and I showed you all all these images and I was like, so I'm thinking maybe this, and I think that can sometimes be confusing for um, if, if you're not accustomed to how, how I tend to operate. So, you know, I sort of conceptualized the show itself, what it is that I want it to look like, who what what sort of images make the most sense in terms of having these sort of relationships or conversations that get sparked, uh, which I have to say, I really love uh, all of the sort of installation and the way that you all uh, hung the work to where it sort of sparks those extra dialogues that I was kind of hoping would, would come through. So if you haven't been, you should. Um, and then, you know, because I've already scanned it, I have a large format printer that I do the printing myself. I prep the print. Um, I now have a fabricator that I drop off to have the prints mounted to dye bond, but I do still do my own mounting for other um, circumstances. We'll, I'm sure, talk about this later, but I'm 
sort of delving back into canvas, uh, for example, and sculptural work. And so those I mount myself. Um, and then they come back, I build a cradle. So you can finally actually see the photograph itself because you know often they're so small and so tiny I can't see very big details. Mm -hmm. um, I, I usually have some sort of color mock-up or some sort of guide that helps me establish color relationships because as you can probably guess color is very important in this work. Can you talk a little bit about the color? So a visitor who came in this week said, um, gosh, you know, you could, this is so cohesive, like across the works, the color palette feels very cohesive. But can you talk a little bit about how you come to the color? Because of course the images are black and white. Yeah, yeah, that, that is, that's also a great question. Um, so, you know, generally speaking, I found that when I'm working, so I, I tend to work on multiple paintings at the same time um, for my own personal attention. And then also because I'm working with oil paint and I have to wait for it to dry. And so sometimes I have to bounce back and forth. Um, so even though I'm doing color mock-ups separately, um, the colors all end up kind of still bleeding together in a way. And, and part of this is I use every color. And so eventually they're just all gonna kind of go together. Um, but usually when I, I start a color mock-up, uh, a specific color will come forward for me. Um, and then I build a color scheme around that. So in the case of the painting that is on our left of the Iranian women, um, that blue was sort of the first thing that came forward. Um, and I wanted to build the, the color scheme around that blue. And then for the, the father and son, um, the Greek family on the right, uh, that sort of hunter green is not a color I get to use very often. And so I knew I wanted to, to do that, especially for that sort of painted backdrop that was behind them. Um, so it, it kind of depends, you know, it, it always ends up being very hypersaturated. And part of that is sort of this nod to this sort of otherworldliness or this um, space that the figures are inhabiting where they're not quite alive, but also not quite dead. They're, they're here as a sort of visitation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the colors kind of clue you into the fact that things are not quite um, our, our sort of world, if that makes sense. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the, I mean, all of the choices are so interesting to me. I mean, the, the first choice of, of your selection of the image in, in the first place is, I think, so fascinating, which are the families that you engaged with when you looked at the original images. I love the choices that you made for our show. And I remember when we had that conversation about what the exhibition was going to be, and you said, oh, let me show you what I'm thinking about. And they were all black and white. And you asked us, what do you think? And I said, well, I think they're really interesting, but this isn't what they're going to look like, right? I mean, it was really funny because, of course, this is the this is the process and how you get started. Um, but we've had so many questions from people who visit the gallery asking about um, your choices when you start painting on the surface of the photographs, the choices that you made about, um, so we've talked about the color, but about the faces, a lot of question about the faces and whether you've um, obscured them um, in the way that the, the Iranian women on our left, you've filled in the faces almost completely, whereas the, the Greek um, gentleman on the right, um, less so. Um, and then we, we, lots of questions about faces, and we've had lots of questions about hands. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, well, those are very purposeful choices. Um, so, you know, for me, I'm thinking about sort of, you know, if we're thinking about a photographic portrait, it's this sort of exactitude, you know, you get all of the details for the most part of the, the cameras and focus and everything. Um, so that, that tends to be the case for a photographic portrait, whereas a painted portrait is less about exactitude and more about sort of a likeness or a sense of being or a sense of self. And so I'm kind of interested in converting these photographic, like, I think of almost as, as skeletons or, you know, this, it, it could be a, a substrate as well, but like, you know, this sort of baseline. Um, and I'm more or less faithful to the original photograph depending on each piece. It's a very individual process for each painting. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about the paint as a way of sort of asking you to look closer, you know, it's almost like by partially obscuring something, you're kind of leaning in to examine a little bit closer. It's like whispering in a way. Um, 
I'm also thinking about the color washes. I know some people have, have mentioned things like auras to me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have that sort of specific symbiology per se, but I do sort of almost imagine them as sort of these beings that are glowing in a way. So, you know, thinking again about likeness, I think so much of how we think about ourselves and our personalities in these kind of images come through not just in terms of the face and facial expressions, but also the hands and a gesture. Um, and so that's why often you'll see the hands being touched in the same sort of way, you know, in the, in the case of um, the father and son, you know, it's just the father's hands that are um, painted with that wash. And it's sort of a cloud that's covering uh, the son and a little bit who's so clearly um, reverent and, and devoted to his father and it's hard to see on this documentation but on the original photograph that was actually partially hand painted um so there's a little bit of like blush on his cheeks so that's also why i decided to preserve that that element um in the case of the the women on the other hand you know the it's hard to see on the screen but the it's a color fade so it starts pink and then goes into a sort of a, a purpley um shade and it flips back and forth so i don't know the exact relationship between these women beyond family so they could be sisters they could be cousins um so thinking about that sort of aspect of connection um is also another way of like um using the wash in that way mm -hmm. so i think the, you know the colors are so unusual this this very interesting uh, decisions that you're making about faces, the hands, the, um, asking us to look more closely, thinking about the gestures. The other question that comes up often, and this is a good juxtaposition between the two pieces that we have on the screen, how are you adding what I know you refer to as the patterning? How are you choosing things like the um, the different floral motifs? And the, the flowers in these two works are quite different. Um, how do how do those come to you? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Well, they are very different. One is sourced; uh, it's a um, a Morris uh, wallpaper pattern mm -hmm. design on the left, and the one on the right is actually uh, a flower that I have a photograph of in my phone that I converted into sort of a pattern. So the uh, floral patterns are operating in a, a lot of different ways in the paintings overall. So firstly, you know, the, the choice of floral patterning, it's meant to add this sort of element of, of beautification or adornment to the figures and to the, the painting itself. Um, there are times where the patterns will sort of underline or demonstrate connections or relationships uh, with the figures in the image. Sometimes it'll <clears throat> fix some compositional problems that are in uh, vernacular photographs. And, you know, thinking about floral patterning in general, um, you know, thinking about like, uh, Western art history and a still life specifically and how uh, flowers will be painted with like one um, petal sort of dropping and it's meant to be a representation or a symbol of the the fleetingness of life that um, we're all going to die basically um, but in my paintings the flowers are always blooming and are always alive which again sort of nods to this unreal sense of time that's happening here because you know Again, if we're thinking about the photograph as this sort of static representation, a split second of a moment when the uh, shutter closed basically, versus painting, which can sort of elongate time. Time is not linear in a painting. It can be in cycles. It can be sort of chaotic or dynamic. So merging those two together for me is sort of creating this, this breakage of space and time um, between them. And so the patterns are sort of another add to that, that sort of nod. Um, in mm -hmm. the same way that the color wash, you know, I, I sort of think of the figures as almost glowing. They could also walk out of the, the panels and have these like flower adornments uh, still attached to them, if that makes sense. That makes sense, yeah. Um, I think, okay, Suzanne read my mind. So I wanted to advance um, to show people some more of the of the pieces in the show. This is actually the largest work that we have in the show. Um, and there's just a lot of beautiful 
uh, patterning and layering here. Um, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the background and the foreground that you're creating. Um, in some cases, like the women that we were just looking at was entirely blue behind the figures. But here we see the lush greenery of the garden that this family is in. Maybe you'll talk a little bit about that. And I should note, we have a couple questions in our Q&A and I was remiss at the beginning and not saying to people, um, please uh, post your questions in the Q&A and we will do our best to answer them. And we have a couple questions about framing and people wanting to know about frames. And we will absolutely get to that in just a few more minutes because there's lots of good, um, interesting things for you to tell us about how you are approaching that. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, space for me in these paintings is very sort of fractured and fragmented. Again, the sort of like nod to a, a, a liminal space that these figures are inhabiting. Um, this painting specifically is sort of in conversation with a previous painting I had done, <laughs> uh, called uh, The Gardener from 2017. It's, it's one of my personal favorite paintings. I actually wish I had never sold that one, I wish I had it still. Um, I don't have it, um, but in any case, you know, I, I am at a point now with the series where I'm sort of rethinking and revisiting previous paintings in a certain way, um, not to like replicate them per se, but just like sort of having this sort of conversation, um, if that makes sense. And so I, I've had this photograph for a very long time and I've been, and a lot of these photographs, some of them I've had for years and years and years, and I've just been waiting for the right time for them to be painted. Um, whereas other ones I snap up and I'm like, I'm going to paint this one right now. Um, so this one I had been, been waiting for for a long time because I really loved sort of the lush foliage all around them. I loved the ways that they were embedded in nature, you know, almost like hidden or, or part of it. So those, all of those things sort of drew me to this specific image um, and being part of the show. So, you know, when I'm thinking about these kinds of like really elaborate scenes, you know, what, what gets rendered versus what becomes more abstracted, it really depends. But, you know, there has to be this sort of balance um, back and mm -hmm. forth. So, you know, for example, the, um, the greenery that is surrounding the figures on the left is, you know, this sort of flat um, green color that mm -hmm. almost looks like a cloud that's kind of enveloping them. I, I liked that aspect to it versus, you know, having the top be so rendered out um, with all of the, the detail. That was actually the first part that I started painting was that um, purpley blue greenery. Um, and so I make those decisions as I'm painting, like some, I, you know, I, I'll know what color I want something to be, but I'll sit there and think, how should this be painted? Because I want, you know, at the end of the day, um, they are paintings in the sense that I need to think about, you know, texture and, and surface and all of those sort of things and, and how they're sort of going together. Um, there's also like patterning that's painted on some of the flat colors. Um, so that, that, you know, is this like, sort of floral element on top of floral element. Um, so this was also the last painting that I painted for the show. Um, I was real behind because of the power outage, um, but it was also one of my favorite pieces, yeah. Wow, we have, someone online is asking what the size of this one is. And this one happens to be just over 130 inches wide and 91 and a half inches tall. Um, so it is a beautiful, beautiful piece. Um, Suzanne, if we advance, I wonder if we can find, aha, um, some beautiful frames. Um, so this is a very unusual, I think, aspect of your work that you are, you're really incorporating the frame as such a beautiful integral part of the piece. And um, the catalog that we have, um, Dr. Uh, Jimena Gomez wrote a beautiful essay about this series. And she notes that you are so meticulous that you have even painted the bottoms of the frame for a viewer who really wants to get down underneath and look up, um, which is quite extraordinary. But these are incredible frames. Um, and you're adding on the left here, you're adding these beautiful pediments um, to, the, to the frame. And then uh, the one on the right, um, I think that's one whole piece 
that you've repurposed. Um, but maybe you can talk a little bit about the frames and about your decision to embellish them and incorporate them in this way. Yeah, yeah. So with Hands Clasped Tightly is the first exhibition where I've had all of the work framed, um, which was a lot of a, a learning process because I, I became a carpenter and woodworker on top of a painter and everything else that I was already doing. Um, so I, I, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, I mean, the overall series is so much about this sort of aspect of the sacred, in this case, the family photograph. It's this sort of relic um, that's been touched and held and, and kept and preserved over the course of years, um, decades, centuries even. And, you know, thinking about sort of this already embedded aspect of the sacred into this work, um, you know, thinking about you know, this sort of aspect of time and um, the people that are in the image may no longer be with us. And so this sort of, again, visitation. I wanted to sort of make visual these languages of the sacred um, with these sort of almost like altar-like spaces. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's what I was kind of thinking about with the frames. So I was looking at a lot of things like, you know, Persian mosques and how they're just so ornate and beautiful, um, as well as like, you know, Baroque Catholic churches, that sort of thing. So just like, again, just really over the top um, sort of stuff. And um, it initially was, you know, I some of them I was building my own frame, some of them I had found um, frame. So in the case of the one on the right, that's a found mirror frame. And of course that has that added dimension of it being a, uh, previously a mirror. So the idea of the body standing in front of a mirror looking and looking at a photograph that is also an object that was looked at um, is a sort of interesting relationship that's happening. So I have a lot of, I've been collecting a lot of <clears throat> furniture um, chairs, um, but mostly mirrors um, to convert uh, in this way. Mm -hmm. And then for the larger work, you know, again, thinking about, you know, the architecture of the sacred, um, you know, some of them have pediments, uh, some of them have other sort of things, but, you know, the frame itself is like very ornately painted. I don't think we have an image I in think here. If we advance, Suzanne, maybe we have an image that will show us the side of one of the frames. Uh -huh. Yes. You can see this. This is the upper left image here is capturing the side of the frame there with some of the detailing that you've added, which actually is three-dimensional. Yes, that, that portion is what applicates. So every piece is a little bit different. Again, like in the same way that I, I, I'm thinking about them as individual selves that all kind of sort of come together. So there are some instances where I'm working with like wood salvage, um, uh, antique wood salvage to create the pediments. Like in the case of the one on the upper left, that's the father and daughter with tall daisies painting. Um, that one has that wood pediment that is at the top. Um, then there are others where I'm, you know, individually painting the pattern, sort of um, reiterating the original pattern that's in the painting itself. In the case of the garden family, that patterning was also a Morris um, uh, wallpaper pattern. And so I only took one element from it for the floral patterning in the painting itself but the patterning that's on the sides of the frame are actually another aspect of that pattern, just a, a different portion of it. Um, so instead of it looking like it's a different pattern, it's actually sort of connected. Um, so yeah, so each- Well, I was gonna ask you a very different question just because we're looking at this slide. It, it's very different, um, the piece in the bottom left here where the figures are almost like a, um, a galaxy, almost like we're looking into um, the stars, you know, or the constellations or something like that. Of the works in this series, this is the only one where the figures appear in, in this way. I wonder if you mm -hmm. might say something about that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I again, this, this always ends up being this sort of like individual process. And there are certain things that I am drawn to over and over again in terms of like thinking about time, um, in terms of thinking about sort of our connections to the natural world. Um, you know, not to like be cheesy about like world stardust kind of a thing, but like 
you know, also these sort of cosmologies of ourselves that are there, both like in terms of like the family as a co uh, cosmos and then, um, you know, the self and then also the connection between um, us. And then, you know, there's another piece in the, uh, in the show where uh, the mother and child are completely painted in a wash, um, almost, you know, her whole body. And um, it sort of shifts color tone throughout it. And so again, sort of thinking about um, these different ways of seeing um, and different ways of thinking about each other and, and, and that natural world, if that makes sense. Yeah, they're just beautiful. This is a, a great slide that gives us three very different styles of the framing um, that you've created. And um, well, and we do, I, we had the, the prior slide, we had the two women and the dog. Um, and in this slide, we see one of your beautiful images of a woman with a baby. And um, we have quite a few babies in this exhibition, um, which is really fun to see. Um, these are quite unusual. Maybe tell us a little bit about these frames and about the the pediment style and also the the um, almost a portal, the one in the middle. Yeah, yeah. So the two outer ones are ones where I, I made the frame myself. You know, I, I fabricated the whole thing. And then the center one is a shutter mirror um, frame that I had found. Um, so, you know, as I, I for all of the pieces in the show, what ended up happening was I, I actually painted the whole piece and then started to think about framing afterwards. So once the piece was fully completed, um, obviously if I'm working with a found frame like the one in the center, then you know I'm incorporating that as part of the color mock-up and sort of planning. Um, but for the other ones and, and the vast majority, it's sort of this, this process. So you know, I have all of these different pieces that I've collected, pediments or, or um, items of decoration that um, I'm sort of playing this almost in, in the same way that I do with patterning. It's it's almost a matchmaking process, like who makes the most sense? Um, maybe it's a shape, maybe it's a, an element that is repeated in the actual piece itself, or maybe there's, there's something about it that to me sort of has this sort of connection. And so, in the case of like, for example, the far left, you know, she, the pattern is already incredibly ornate, incredibly detailed. And so I really liked the idea um, to punish myself in kind. <laughs> um, a lot of my painting is masochism um, disguised as art. Um, I, I wanted something that had that sort of beauty and ornateness. So like you can't see, but the, the sides are also the wood appliques and they're very, very detailed and ornate as well. It's uh, flowers and these like beautiful oh, stem sort of things that go together and they're painted with like lavender uh, and coral and white um, to kind of sort of enhance the, the painting itself. Um, the piece in the center um, is, is actually one of my favorite paintings. Um, the shutter window is one of the earlier mirror frame pieces that I made. And again, the sort of learning process of having to repurpose, strip, paint, figure out how to reconnect because a lot of like, you know, the hardware is completely destroyed because it's so old. Um, figure out how to get it to work properly. Um, it is a whole ordeal, but um, I love this sort of idea, and especially with her pose, like she's almost like looking out the window in a way, um, sort of uh, inviting you to, to share a moment with her. Um, this one is so then, charming because the doors function, right? The, the the shutters open and close and you've attached lovely little satin ribbons on the sides of this one to hold it open so that she can gaze out that window and engage with the viewer, um, which is so interesting. So I wonder, so Alana Campbell, who works with us in the gallery um, and joined us uh, in July this summer, one of the questions that she asked uh was thinking about a lot of the images, most of the images in this series, we're in, we're looking or the the subjects are looking right out at us, right? There's a lot of eye contact with this um with this group of people and this these families, and they're they're really engaging with us. 
Um, you, you've not chosen images of people who are looking away or, you know, wistfully off into the distance. Um, you know, these people really, they, they um, exactly as you said earlier, they, they look like they could just walk right out <laughs> and, and, you know, and have a conversation. Is that purposeful on your part, thinking about the engagement and the eye contact? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm a little confrontational in that way. Um, you know, when I was a photographer, I was very interested in confrontation and sort of like forcing a relationship or a connection through the camera lens. And so that has converted over into this work as well. So the, of the photographs that I'm collecting, I'm usually collecting from the beginning of photographic history through maybe like the 70s or 80s. Um, there's a certain point where like the time period becomes this sort of it sort of reeks of nostalgia in the sense of like sentimentality rather than like the original definition of nostalgia is like pain of remembering. And so uh, I, I'm usually looking for someone who we can have this sort of connection with. There are a few, there are a few works where the person is not directly looking often, but I, I love this sort of one-to-one -one connection where they're just like looking at you, um, you know, like a lot of Victorian photographs, for example, they're not making direct eye contact. And so of the Victorians that I have and that I paint are the ones that are doing that. Um, I also think there's something that's kind of interesting for me about sort of elbowing the photographer and their gaze out of the frame, if you will, and sort of replacing it with me um, as well as the audience, you know? Um, if you're looking at someone and they're looking back at you, I, I know for some that can be a little discomforting, but also it can be inviting um, mm -hmm. a way of forming uh, the sort of web of connection between you and the person that's in the, the piece. Terrific. I wanted to give you um, a little bit of time. You've been so busy doing these incredible <laughs> pieces. And I know you've, you've um, also got work on view right now um in um in Manchester Connecticut yes yes and so the... um you your studio you've been busy 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 and I know you you even we talked earlier today there's some pieces that are headed out of the studio um that have just been finished um okay yeah. <laughs> right behind you there there's one right so, there too. <laughs> I, I feel like it, it is somewhat facetious to even ask you what are you going to do next um but I know that there is some um incredible beautiful um, sculptural uh, work out there that um, that you've just created. I wondered if you might tell us a little bit about this beautiful chair. Yeah, I you know I think that having this um, delightful studio space has given me the ability to. I, a lot of this is work that I wanted to do for many many years. I was in flux, moving, um, being married to an academic has its challenges. And, you know, when we returned to Massachusetts, that was in fall of 2019. Um, so barely had chance to get our bearings before being plunged into the pandemic and trying to navigate all of that, especially for me as a disabled person. Um, and so starting in 2020, I had actually started thinking about this idea of incorporating furniture. Um, you know, I, I adore artists such as uh, Dora Salcedo and Christian Boltanski and thinking about how some of these objects are so imbued with and embodied, you know, like they had the body attached to them or like their function is for that. Um, and so I had come across this um, East Lake antique uh, settee that had like two, um, seat uh back cushions and had the you know the seat itself and i had this idea for it as part of a, an upcoming exhibition at cuesta college in san luis obispo california that's in january of 2025 so it's going to be a wedding uh show and so i liked the idea of having like the bride and groom and then a sort of bed of flowers and um couldn't couldn't get to that immediately but loved the idea of trying to test out what that would look like um i collected a bunch of chairs as well. And so that piece on the left is my first sort of sculptural piece. Um, and it's, you know, fully dimensional, of course, like the, the flowers and the greenery that's coming off the back is meant to be, you know, it's meant to be um, uh, seen from all, uh, all spaces. Um, 
And then for the one on the right, I'm looking at it in my studio right now. It's, it's the painting is completely done. Um, I just have to finish the border part. Um, so for a very long time, I, I mean, I, I painted with canvas uh, as a youth in uh, my undergrad and then very briefly during grad school when I tried to make a, an attempt to return to painting then that didn't work out. And then I've painted on board and panel since. And so I have thought a very long time about what this work would look like on campus. And I've always hated canvas prints and I've never really liked the idea of it. Um, and was just very like, ah, I don't know, I don't know. You but, didn't uh, like the quality of the image on the canvas? The clarity of the image or something about the texture of the canvas? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, they kind of look a little kitschy in a way a lot of the times, you know, I, I used to work as a lab tech, so I got to print on a variety of materials. And so, you know, I would see canvas prints and I just like, ugh, <laughs> they're all <laughs> no shade to whoever's working with canvas. Um, but, you know, for my purposes, you know, I also wasn't sure if I liked the idea of being able to paint on a photo print. Um, and what that sort of represented and entailed. And to me, Canvas sort of shifted the languages a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I also started to get really sort of interested and obsessed with like the language of tapestries and um, also like Persian rugs. And so that is where um, I'm going with the Canvas work. Um, so I'm going to be embroidering um, some patterning that's going to be a nod to, to rugs um, and carpets, and then also uh, layering, ruffling um, fabric, uh, floral fabrics mostly. Um, I don't know how it's going to look yet because I haven't done it yet, but it should be interesting. <laughs> um, and I, I don't see these as like replacements of the series overall, but rather like um, to me, this series has really exploded in terms of like what the objects can be. And so, you know, I'm still making, you know, this um, uh, paneled uh, framed work, as well as I'm working on, you know, like for example, I've got a whole tree mirror that I'm looking at on this side uh, that is sort of on the line of, of sculpture and, you know, sort of two dimensions. So I'm, I'm I'm really interested in sort of pushing this work into new directions that I've been wanting to do for many years and just didn't have the space or the, the equipment to do so. Um, so I'm pretty excited about it actually. So interesting and two very d related, obviously to the things that we've been talking about all evening, but you know, feeling also very different and new directions in both of these things um, that we're looking at here on this slide. So, well, I want to invite um, anyone who has a question to pop it into the Q&A, we might have time um, to answer a few more questions. And um, I also wanted to plug our beautiful catalog for the show, um, which is absolutely um, a fabulous uh, way to see all the work in the show. And there's a wonderful essay. I was actually very touched um, by the essay that uh, Dr. Jimena Gomez uh, prepared on uh, on your on behalf of the show, and um, she's the assistant professor of American art at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and you've gotten to know her well. And um, I thought that she just wrote a, a wonderful piece. Um, she uh, she was very kind um, to participate in our endeavor, and the catalog is available on our website um, for anybody that would like to have a copy. Um, so I really want to, um, oh, we got another question. All right. I, so we, we've had a couple questions about paper that you use and also the kind of paint that you're using. And um, I know that these are oils. These are oil paintings. And that was one of the reasons also that you referenced that you are working on multiple things at a time, because of course they take a long time to, um, to, to dry and cure. And you know before you can go back to them, many of them are very layered. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about the paper and the, and the print just very quickly? Yeah, it, it kind of depends on the the piece itself, I mean, I'm, I'm typically using just like an Epson enhanced matte paper. So I prefer a matte paper as opposed to a luster or something that has like shine to it, um, which is also how I varnish my work. Like I want I want the work to look exactly like it did when I painted it mm -hmm. um, rather than have this like hyper glossy sort of finish to it. Um, 
for the canvas, uh, you know, trying to search for the right material was very complicated. Um, I ended up finding a canvas, a printable canvas that was 100% cotton. Um, but you know, all that said, like, <laughs> It is a beast to, to use this material and to uh, do the mounting process. When I used to do it just solely by myself, I used to pull in a few extra folks and it was like a, a 48 hour process that was very, very complicated. Um, and it was very easy to make mistakes with. Um, and, you know, there's just a tremendous amount of labor that goes into just the fabrication side before even getting to the actual painting portion, like the painting portion is my exciting place to be. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's so much to the process, so much that goes in um, to creating these beautiful works. And um, they really, the, it's transformative in our space. You know, I mean, we were talking earlier today and you were saying that the gallery looks, looks and feels like the perfect white cube um, to show off these things. But, uh, you know, I mean, this, this is just so um, engaging, so beautiful. Um, the very organic Im imagery I just love and the beautiful colors and you just get lost, you know, in this Daisy Patton world um, in the gallery, which is so special. Um, so I hope everyone who has not visited and is able to uh, will come and see us in Houston. Um, the show is going to be up through the 10th of November. So there's still um, a number of weeks to visit us. And of course, we're all available to answer questions and um, to provide any further information um, about the works in the show. Um, and I think I wanna just read very quickly um, something that really uh, leapt off the page at me that Dr. Gomez wrote. Um, and then I'm really gonna thank you for your time tonight and for making yourself available um, for the webinar. But this really, um, this really stuck with me um, in thinking about uh, your painting of photographs, she says, by painting photographs from disparate periods and cultures, Patton not only collapses linear time, she emphasizes the perennial and universal nature of the familial experience. And at the same time, no two paintings are the same, which is underscoring how every family is unique, beautiful, and entangled in its own way. And I think, um, that's one of the reasons it's such a wonderful subject matter uh, for this group of paintings that you've created for us and um, so relatable and just so stunning. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I am so thrilled to get to work together. And I love, I, I think to me, one of the most important things about this work just overall is um, I find that people have very strong sort of emotional reactions to the work. Um, when they see it, um, you know, seeing it on a tiny screen is one thing. And I've, every time someone comes over to my studio in person, they're immediately like, this is not what I was expecting. So I'm, I'm always, I, I think to me, there's something um, really transformative and, and transporting about being able to be in, in the presence of them, if that makes sense. Not in a, my work is amazing, but more in just like the context of like, you know, by them being life-sized, you are able to have this sort of connection that happens, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you wouldn't be able to be here every day. Um, even if you were closer, you wouldn't be able to be here every day to see people coming and going in the gallery, but people walk in the door and there's just kind of this, wow, you know, there's like a, a moment where people are taking it all in, which is really exciting. Um, so I'm just going to remind um, everybody that we did record the conversation tonight and it'll be available on YouTube if anybody wants to send it around or share it. And also the catalog is available online. I should have said that. Um, so people can pull that up and all the images are there as well. If people want to um, read what Dr. Gomez wrote and also uh, get a little more familiar with the pieces in the show. Um, but thank you so much. I love being with you all and seeing you. Um, and I was complimenting Daisy earlier that her lipstick was the perfect match uh, for the piece that she's sitting in front of. And of course, because we know her, we know that that was intended. <laughs> thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you Thanks so much. Good night.